So let's just start with what the FBI uh, Association ha has called for, and that is to make domestic terror an actual federal crime. I mean, I was uh, amazed that it's not. What is that the right first move? I think it's necessary, and it's been called for for years, mm -hmm. um, especially in the past few years. There has been a year-on-year -year increase in incidents of hate crime, in extremist murders, terrorist plots by far-right extremists. Really, since 2015, these numbers have increased year-on-year, -year, mm -hmm. yet the current administration hasn't really done anything about it. So it was, it was absolutely needed that especially the FBI itself is calling for that. What has, I mean, why hasn't it? Is there sort of a conflict between what you can do against, I mean, some people say it's freedom of speech or freedom of this, that, or the other that's online, that you can't, you can't sort of crack down on these. I think it's certainly harder in the United States than, for example, in the UK, because of the First Amendment, because free speech is so absolute. Mm -hmm. So whereas the British government can crack down on websites and can arrest people for racial incitement, those laws do not exist and they will never exist in the United States. However, there's also a political issue. Um, when the Trump administration came in, they had the attitude that being worried and being concerned about white nationalism is a bit of a, a liberal issue. It's a bit of an Obama issue. The real enemy is radical Islam. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of efforts were shifted in that direction. And programs that dealt with right-wing extremism were, in fact, shut down. So let's just take that because radical Islam for a long time was and exactly. still in other places remains a problem. But it's shifted in the U.S. Uh, they're not coming from abroad to infiltrate the U.S. They're sort of radicalizing, or they were, mm. inside the United States. Um, massacres done in the name of, of Islam. But now even that's shifted to this white nationalism, to this mm. white supremacy. So how much of a heavy lift is it to move law enforcement and statutes and all the political and security efforts that need to take place? I think it's less difficult than it seems. Uh, at the FBI, for example, at DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, there are people who've been working on these issues for years, except in the past few years they've been sidelined. I think they need to be brought up again. They need to be promoted again. People have to be told, you can make a career, you can get a promotion by looking after white nationalists. That's not been the case for the past mm -hmm. few years. It was not a priority. And by making it a priority again, you can, I think, recycle some of these energies that have been lost over the past few years. So we heard President Trump categorically denounce the monster, the white supremacy, racism, terrorism. He used all of those words in one sentence. Mm -hmm. And then he added um, mental health issues, red flags, video games, death penalty. I'm going to play this soundbite. Mm. It's one of his solutions for this crime. Today, I'm also directing the Department of Justice to propose legislation ensuring that those who commit hate crimes and mass murders face the death penalty and that this capital punishment be delivered quickly, decisively, and without years of needless delay. So is that a solution? I don't think it necessarily is. It depends what you think about the death penalty. I think it would be much more important, in fact, to change the rhetoric, uh, because it's very clear that part of this increase of the past few years has been because of a political climate, a polarized, paranoid political climate, which has enabled some of these very ugly actions that we've seen. Mm -hmm. If someone constantly speaks about invasion, Someone speaks about an existential threat to the nation coming from immigrants. You shouldn't be surprised that some people conclude that it's now time to take matters into their own hands. I think that's the issue, not necessarily any particular law. So the El Paso killer did post online on this 8chan extremist site, which now has been closed down, um, that it was about the invasion by Hispanics, exactly. the Hispanic invasion of the United States. So we know that President Trump has used all sorts of words like that infestation invasion. And his people will obviously deflect any criticism mm -hmm. that this tone is set from the top. But the New York Times is reporting today that the Trump campaign 
has been using Facebook ads to amplify invasion claims. Since January, the re-election campaign, according to the Times, has posted more than 2,000 ads on Facebook that include the word invasion. It's part of a barrage of advertising. Um, and it's very different than the mm. terminology of the 2016. It, it looks like up until now, they have they've taken that word as a wedge issue mm. for an election campaign. Now, they'll deny it. Do you think that this will stop? I don't think it can stop. I think the political brand of Donald Trump very much relies on white outrage. And we've seen in 2016, but also in 2018, and I predict we will see in 2020 that he will ramp up that rhetoric when it, whenever it comes to the election day because he knows that it mobilizes his base. Uh, Steve Bannon, his former assistant, mm -hmm. He once said, anger is what, people, what gets people to the polls. Mm -hmm. And that's how he ran the 2016 campaign. That's how he won it. And that, that is unfortunately how he's, he, he's planning to win it again. And that's why whatever he says in the White House, whatever he reads from a pre-prepared statement uh, is one thing. The other thing is to see what he will say at the next MAGA rally when he speaks to his base. Well, obviously, we've got to really watch all this and hold him to his own words Absolutely. now, the words that he spoke from the White House in the aftermath of this, this tragedy. Mm. Um, I don't know what to call it. It's obviously a tragedy, but it's a mass murder as well. And I think too many people just look at the victims, which is obvious we have to mourn them, but don't look at the politics. If this had been an Islamic terrorist, mm posting a manifesto on the website, all hell would have broken loose in the United States. Massive resources would have been committed to that. But because it was this, suddenly we were told, oh, it's too soon to talk about the politics. You can't talk about guns. You can't mm -hmm. talk about you know, national security or, or, or domestic terrorism mm -hmm. means. The politics surely has to change as well around this. Yes, and I think one of the key cornerstones of the politics for the past few years have been to portray terrorism and counterterrorism as an immigration issue, as something that comes from outside in. That's why we have to close down borders. That's why you have to keep Muslims out. That's why we have to build a wall to Mexico because ISIS is coming through Mexico into the country. And I think people now need to understand this is not necessarily an issue that comes from the outside in. It is an issue that already exists within American society and it requires different tools from the ones that Donald Trump advocates in 2016. All right, Peter Neumann, we'll continue to watch this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.